seconds. Great. Good evening, everyone. I'm Manu Thomas. I'm the Director of Pupil Personnel Services. I'm here tonight with um, Mr. Hoger, as well as Dr. Lada McGinn. Dr. Lada McGinn is a um, psychologist at Cognitive and Behavioral Consultants of Westchester in, in Manhattan, and she will be talking to us about um, trauma, psychological first aid. She's an expert in cognitive behavioral therapy. And the title of today's presentation is How to Foster Psychological Resilience in the Wake of Trauma and Adversity. Just a reminder that uh, Mr. Hozier shared a Google form to submit any questions. Uh, we will be reviewing the questions and um, asking them at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. McGinn, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Minu, and thank you, Kyle. I really uh, am so sorry to be here under these circumstances and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, so, I know that we're here today because the school community has been shaken by the sudden and unexpected that death of a student. The loss for the family is obviously the most profound. And to them, I offer my heartfelt condolences and warmth as they grieve the loss of a child, a sibling, a nephew, a grandchild. We're also here today because your children have all been impacted by the news and you are also impacted by the loss as is the whole school community. This has been a hard couple of years for our communities locally and globally in general, as we continue to, to deal with the pandemic, um, your families have had to adjust with the return to school, the stresses of high school, and other adversities and traumas that may come along. Coming on the heels of all this now comes this sudden loss. This cannot be easy. I hope that what I share today will give you some tools to cope with what you and your child are going through uh, and may uh, find of some use uh, should um, other adversities come your way. So uh, the, the presentation is divided into three sections. I'm just going to first review what a traumatic event is and what are ways that people react to it. I'll talk a little bit about what psychological first aid is, and the bulk of it will be focused on how you can really provide psychological first aid to your, um, to your children. So let's talk about just understanding what trauma is and what reactions um, that people have. So a traumatic event, I mean, the word trauma is used so frequently. It's an event that threatens or seriously injures our life. And the other way that it's defined is that it's really out of the range of normal human experience. Um, people may directly experience it, they may witness someone else who has experienced it, or learn that a close family friend or family member um, has experienced it. There are other ways as well, but the sudden loss of a peer is certainly something that um, is what would be considered a traumatic event, being physically or sexually injured or assaulted, having car accidents or other types of accidents, uh, civilian disasters such as fires, earthquakes, floods, you know, man-made disasters, you know, school shootings, um, and of course things like military combat and so on also comprise what we consider to be traumatic events. So the good news here is that people are generally very resilient and they adjust and recover over time when they are faced with adversity or stress or trauma, and they really don't need any specialized intervention. These reactions vary. They can take days, they can take weeks, months, or longer to fade. And sometimes, and some people need help, and that's okay too. More good news is that you don't have to do a lot of work to be helpful to your child at this time. And in doing so, you can also help yourself by helping your child. So let's just define what psychological first aid is. It's an evidence-informed way to foster psychological resilience if something happens that is 
a trauma or a stress. And it's not something that only professionals do. In fact, uh, lay people are trained in doing that in case there are, let's say, uh, large scale disasters. So lay, lay people are trained to provide that to people in need. And what it does is that really, um, I mentioned that generally we are resilient. So PFA, or that's the abbreviation for psychological first aid, it really builds on that natural resilience and it helps us adjust to um, negative things that happened. Um, and it can be for people of all ages who are affected. Um, and it's really designed to reduce the distress that can come uh, from experiencing a negative event. And it also is a way to foster short-term and long-term coping. And when does it actually help? It helps when someone is in distress. It can, it's, it's typically given you know, right after a crisis. Uh, but it can be given long after as well. It can be given in an emergency, in a non-emergency, uh, and it could be a personal crisis or a larger crisis. And the thing also to keep in mind is that some people just naturally you know, adjust and recover without PFA, and some people might need additional help beyond PFA. So what does it actually do? It really helps you, I mean, think of it as something that some of you may naturally do to others uh, who are in need. It helps you listen to people's needs and concerns, but without being intrusive. Um, and it's, it addresses very basic immediate needs that people have at the moment. It's not meant to be something that helps you meet your long-term goals. It's a way of comforting someone when they're in need, it helps them feel safe, calm, supported. And, you know, you're checking in with them to make sure that they're not, you know, in any harm. Uh, and it's a way of providing emotional support. And you're also providing information on skills that can help people build resilience. So you're not actually a trainer in doing skills training, but you're providing information that can actually help. Uh, and then you're linking them to information to get further help if they should they need it. So now this is a third part of what we'll go over, and this is what we'll spend the most time on, which is what are the components of PFA? So I've broken it up into three categories, which is look, to listen, and then to link people in need. So let's start with look. What you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out, you're looking to see what people are, what your child may be going through and how are they reacting? Children aren't always uh, open about how they feel. So first is looking to see what your child's experience is. So we know again, that there has been uh, a death in the school. On top of that, your children are facing an ongoing pandemic, academic workload and pressure, college stresses, social media, and others uh, that they may personally be dealing with. So first is just trying to understand what your child's experience is. And the second is trying to understand what changes you see. You know, what is, what are they feeling? What are they thinking? And what are they actually doing to cope? So before I get into the specifics, and you will see that there is quite a number of uh, ways that people react, a number of feelings they have, number of thoughts they might have, you know, and what they may be doing or not doing to cope. The thing to keep in mind as I go through this long list is that all of it is pretty normal. And it is something that it's okay for them to feel or think or do. Uh, we'll talk later on about when, you know, should you get others involved. So, We'll start with how people feel. There are lots of common emotions that people feel when they've gone through something traumatic. They can have anxiety, they can have sadness, they can cry easily. Um, they, may, may, they may say they don't feel pleasure. They might have other negative emotions like feeling angry, feeling guilty, feeling shame. And then the other thing is some, some people may not feel anything at all. Often when something traumatic happens, people, some people get pretty numb and may not feel anything at all. That's okay too. Um, sometimes people also 
will not share how they're feeling, but may experience it as physical symptoms. So a whole range of physical symptoms that come with having these emotions like muscle tension or racing heart or being slowed down. Um, and I'm gonna be sharing the handouts with you. So it's not something that you need to memorize, but you will, you know, may notice that they have headaches or stomach aches. Sometimes people feel like they are disconnected from their bodies um, and from people. And that may be something that someone experiences after a traumatic event. And it's kind of unexpected who feels it. So it could be that somebody very, very close to uh, the student who passed away uh, may feel differently. And somebody who maybe didn't even know them that well may have a very intense reaction. So it's hard to predict uh, for you and for us. Uh, we, you know, in the profession, we do have some knowledge of you know what makes people more likely uh, to have a reaction, but otherwise just from uh, the closeness to which they might have experienced it is not often an indicator. Um, you also may find that uh, you know something that reminds them of uh, what happened uh, may trigger emotional reactions as well. So all of this I mentioned is normal. So why is it normal? And so when, when your child is in distress, you know, we're programmed as caregivers, right? For our children and, and in my profession, uh, I am programmed that way. Teachers are programmed that way to really be protective and to not want people to feel upset. So, as you see your child experiencing negative emotions, your tendency may be to lean in and, and make them feel better. And that's, and you're, that's okay. But keeping in mind that it's really all right for them to feel that way. Emotions are normal inbuilt alarms to help us survive. Uh, and by nature, they are unpleasant because they're alarmed, like a fire alarm. They're there to trigger us to do things. So anxiety is a reaction to danger and it motivates us to fight and flee. Sadness is a reaction to loss and it's a normal uh, reaction to loss. It means that they're human. Uh, it also helps us know that we need to rest. It draws people in to, you know, that way it, it draws you in to feel empathic. Uh, so all of the, all of these emotions have functions. So, so helping them to feel that it's okay for them to feel it, that you're not scared by their emotional reaction is important. There are other, so now we talked about feelings. Now let's talk about what people think after a traumatic event. So oftentimes they'll have you know, vivid sort of images or thoughts about the traumatic event where they're replaying it because these events are out of the range of normal human experience, a brain doesn't quite know where to put them right away. So they it stays in our upper mind. And that way it sort of can be repeatedly sort of playing in our minds as a song and that's completely normal. Um, they might find themselves sort of ruminating or thinking about the event or how did it happen or they may forget things about what happened. Um, sometimes, you know, people feel like they should have been able to stop something like this from happening or should somebody else should have done something more to stop it from happening, that they might be at blame or responsible for what happened. And then it's natural also for people to then start worrying about themselves, to think, wow, what if this happens to me? What if this happens to my parents? What if this happens to my friends? And so starting to worry about that is also very common. Uh, and, and, and sort of feeling like they need to be on alert and to anticipate bad things from happening to people. Now, again, it doesn't mean that everybody feels all of these things, but any number of these thoughts is very common and people experience it during a traumatic event. Um, some others, or, you know, they might feel that something is wrong with them. And often when you have feelings, and if you have intense feelings, sometimes people judge themselves for having intense feelings. But then again, if someone feels numb, they might judge themselves for feeling too little. Um, often when you're undergoing something traumatic, 
you might find yourself not feeling like people understand you, not feeling like people can be trusted, not feeling like you want to lean on people, you worry about being a burden to others. Um, and this is interesting. And, and having done this now in, in, in so many venues, I know one of the things that sort of struck me as surprising was that when something like this happens and a student passes away or there's a traumatic event, people worry that they'll be the subject of gossip if they were close to the person to whom the traumatic event happened, that they might be a subject of gossip for being associated with the person. So this is also not something that I initially uh, expected, but this is something I've seen over and over again. So this is something to keep in mind, uh, that they feel that they might be judged or stigmatized or you know, told to get over it and to feel okay. And so there's a, th th there could be a little bit of mistrust that happens um, in, in the wake of a traumatic event. Um, what we know is that be becoming, when, when you're under stress, you can be more negative, you can be more inflexible. So this is something that you might you know, be on the lookout for, that they might have extreme thoughts and extreme thoughts like, wow, I will never get over this again, or very judgmental, cynical thoughts about the world, um, and feeling that they are only paying attention to, to sort of stressful information coming in uh, and feeling like they can't cope with it. So on the one hand, thinking that, wow, life will never be the same again, uh, and also thinking that they're permanently damaged as a result. And those kinds of thoughts, if left unchecked, uh, can lead to more uh, sort of longer lasting symptoms, which is why it's important to help manage that in the early days. But it's extremely common to have that in them as well. Now, we've talked about feelings and we've talked about common ways that people think following a traumatic event. Now let's think about what people do and don't do after traumatic event. So I know that often people will feel like I can't go to that cafeteria because that's where I was with the, the person who passed away. As an example, they might avoid certain conversations or avoid certain people. Uh, if the, if sort of the event is sort of going by in their minds, they might try to stop thinking about it. Um, some, some people cope by spending a lot of time alone. Some people spend, are afraid to spend any time alone. And, you know, both of those come, you know, can, again, if left unchecked in the beginning, it's totally fine. But if somebody withdraws and starts to feel alienated and mistrustful of others, uh, and that's something that PFA helps manage. But it's again, it's understandable in the early days. It's also understandable given the negative emotions people have, like anxiety, sadness, that they get more irritable. They might have more increased conflict with you, with others. Uh, that's completely normal. Um, we also know that when something traumatic happens, that people, you know, stop doing the things that normally, you know, so keep them regulated. So not, uh, you know, keeping to a typical routine or structure or their personal grooming or hygiene. They might give up things that were important to them, like I don't want to play sports anymore. Um, and they may find that the things that they're doing are not creating enjoyment. And that's one of the reasons why they want to stop doing the things that typically gave them enjoyment in the past. And again, because alarms, like emotional alarms are so unpleasant, often we find ourselves distracting ourselves from, from them. So you might find that your child, you know, is maybe watching more TV than normal or being even more on social media than normal uh, or using substances. Uh, and again, when something traumatic happens, you know, watching TV or escaping and, and going on social media is natural. But again, that's something PFA helps manage uh, if it continues over time. Uh, they may not do their schoolwork or not feel like they can focus on it. And again, in the early days, that's completely understandable. Uh, but that's something, again, we need to be mindful of.
one thing to keep in mind is that these thoughts, feelings, and emotions and behavior sort of feed off each other. So one can affect the other. So as an example, let's say your child feels, you know, I should have been there for him. I, you know, I, I should have spent more time with him, or I could have done more to prevent this from happening. That can feel, make you feel guilty and ashamed and which can make people withdraw. <clears throat> so a thought can affect a feeling which can then affect your behavior. And we'll talk more about that later. Now I've gone through a whole long list, but the good thing here is that these thoughts, feelings and behaviors are completely normal. And even if they worry you, uh, and they tend to subside, you know, within a few days, weeks or months. Um, and that doesn't mean that if it goes on for months that they don't get help, but just so that you, you're able to take heart by knowing that no matter how much, you know, they're, how intensely they're feeling, like this will go down. So now that you understand and are able to look to see what's going on with your child, the next step is to listen and sort of to lean in and to connect with them. <clears throat> Let me start by talking about what is not good to do following a traumatic event. One is don't assume that your child wants to talk about it or needs to talk about what they've experienced. And it's important that we not encourage a discussion of it, that we encourage them to talk about it or to analyze what happened or to give ask for details. Uh, you want to give them space to talk, which is, we'll go over, but it's important not to ask for details beyond what they're willing to share or asking them to analyze it or figure out what happened. The second thing, second set of do not do's is don't assume you know what they're thinking. We also don't want to assume that someone has post-traumatic stress disorder or are traumatized because they're experiencing negative emotions. It's important that we recognize that these feelings are completely normal. So we don't want to assume that people have a problem just because they're feeling intensely. Um, and even if they are experiencing things that are worrying you, like they're feeling anxious and you want to help them not feel so anxious, or they're feeling sad, but it's hard for you to see them feeling sad, it's important not to focus on those. The other thing is to not offer any inaccurate information. And that is that if some if they ask you, like, do you know if this is what happened or that's what happened? Like, you may not know. So if you don't know the answer to something your child is asking you, it's best to tell them you don't know. And just to say, this is what I know and this is what I don't know. And helping somebody go through something difficult, it's important that inadvertently as parents, we don't minimize what's going on. Um, you know, comments like you'll get over it, or, you know, maybe you're too sensitive, right? There may be well-meaning, but they're not helpful in that moment. And again, you're trying to be reassuring, like, don't worry, it'll be fine that can inadvertently come across as quite invalidating because they may be going through so much pain about what has happened. So what's, what do we actually do? One is just by being there, right? By engaging with the child. So just taking the initiative to just say, you know, do you want to talk? And just as you would be, I'm sure, being calm, compassionate, and sensitive, and just making the space for them and it could be that your child, you know, adolescents, as teens tend to do, reject what you do, reject what you say. And that's okay. You are just saying, I'm here if you want to talk. And that's, that's the best that you can do. And checking in. And what do you do when you have made that space? Is that you're just there to provide safety. You're just your mere presence as a parent is going to be comforting for them. But you are again saying, if you want to share, I'm here. Uh, you're, and the first thing is to acknowledge what has happened, to say, <clears throat> I know that you know, your classmate, your friend has, has died, and 
I want you to know that it's okay for you to share how you feel and what you're going through with me. Uh, I'm not going to ask you for details. I only want you to tell me what you feel comfortable telling me. But I want to just make sure that, you know, you're okay. And giving them, you know, listening carefully, giving them your full attention, listening closely. And we'll talk more about this in a bit, but conveying interest, empathy, that you're, av that you're available and willing to listen no matter how difficult it feels for you. And no matter what reactions they share, normalizing it without judgment, even if you start worrying about it. Um, and then validating that their suffering is real, you know. And you may, let's say you're the parent of a child who didn't really know the classmate that well. And you think that your child is reacting very intensely. That's okay. You still need to validate their suffering is real. Uh, we already talked about, you know, providing honest, accurate information that you that you can give them. But the most important thing in providing comfort other than being there is to just communicate that they're not alone, that you are there to give them support, to keep them safe, and is sharing that it's normal to feel this way. And that will go a long way. You know, you've experienced something traumatic, and it's completely natural that you feel that way, and I'm here for you. And this is something you may instinctively do as a parent, and that's great. But it's important to know that this is doing something so that you're going to feel helpless. Like, what can I do to support my child? And know that just these basic things will provide them immeasurable comfort, even if they reject you while you're doing it. So even if they push you away and say, I don't have time to talk, I have too much work on my plate, right? Or I'm not in the mood to talk about it, or they snap at you irritably, it's still important for you to know that you are making a difference. Now, sometimes, and this number three, it says stabilize. And what that means is if you are talking to your child or you notice that they're crying and they're really feeling so out of control that they're you know, gasping for air, hyperventilating, they're feeling, telling you that they're feeling disconnected from things, and they may not. The most important thing you can do is to remain calm and normalize, give them space, Again, let them know that you're there. Continue normalizing and promoting, you know, acceptance of how they're feeling, even, even if it, let's say, concerning you. Continue empathizing, continue validating. And the one thing that you can add to it is engage their senses to keep them in the present moment. You could do something as simple as ask them to verbalize, you know, who they are, who you are, where they are. You can ask them to breathe deeply. Uh, you can invite them to express, you know, ex just experience the present moment by just, you know, putting their feet firmly on the ground or clenching their uh, fists. You know, there is something that we often do, and you can see the notebook on the right. A student wrote uh, the five, four, three, two, one uh, technique, which is really taking in your immediate environment with you know, five, all your senses, so five things you can see and four things you can smell and so on. And we know, and even if it means just having a meal with them or playing a board game or a puzzle or writing a poem or singing a song, any of these things can just bring them down in the moment. You might have the tendency as a parent to lean in and continue talking to them and it's important that as you empathize and validate that if they're feeling really disconnected or very, very over-emotional and, and not able to control themselves, that just switching to doing something like this will go a long way. So as you're doing this, you're also gathering information. So you're looking to see what emotions are feeling, what thoughts, you know, what, what are they doing, not doing. And that will allow you to see what are the immediate worries and needs. You're not going to focus on solving long-term problems, but what are their immediate basic needs? You know, they're worried that they, you know, are not able to study for a test or they're, they're kind of anxious or feeling guilty that they didn't connect with the person you know, or that they'll be judged or 
you know, you're not, you're avoiding any in-depth descriptions or details, and you want to redirect any conversations about future catastrophic events. So they share worries like, oh my God, what happens and I won't get into college. You can say, well, we'll deal with that one day. Let's talk about what's really making you anxious today. What's on your plate today and how can I help? And that way you can clarify your understanding of what it is that they're worried about. And that way you could summarize it and say, all right, let's, let's come up with some priorities for what I can do, what you can do. Uh, and that leads us to the next step, which is that you're just offering practical help. You know, would you like me to call, you know, the school? Would you like me to get you, um, you know, some, some food right now? It doesn't, you know, whatever, however small the task is that they need help with, you know, should I drive you to school tomorrow or whatever practical help that will address their needs. Uh, you want to build it collaboratively you know, invite them to offer solutions, make it realistic, practical, achievable, and see what they need and build on your child's strengths and what you know from the past in terms of what helps them feel effective, what effective behaviors that they've shown before, build on that. And of course, offer any help you can give without, you know, leaning in so much that they feel incapable, right? That's that balance as a parent, particularly as our children become, you know, adolescents, that you want to help them not feel incapable of doing it themselves. So you're offering any help yet, you know, giving them optimism that you know uh, what they can do and what they can handle. Now comes the third part, which is link. And linking really means you're linking them to support you're linking them to information to help them cope better. And again, you're not training them. You're just giving them information. And if needed, you're linking them to services. So what we know about how people react to trauma is that one of the biggest buffers of experiencing negative emotions is social support. So this means family, friends, it could mean community resources. And the, let's say your child has a tendency when they're stressed out to withdraw, right? You can emphasize the importance of support and social connection. And again, you know, they might have a usual reaction to you as a mom or a dad, which is, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't need this. But again, you're still doing it, which is emphasizing the importance of it one is just showing them, so spending time with them. You know, why don't we just sit down and, you know, walk, go for a walk or go for a drive? Um, you know, even if it is, you know, come help me take the garbage out or, you know, I, I need help with this. Um, and if obviously the, your, your children now, you know, in, spend time with their friends without your involvement, but you can always promote helpful peer interactions. And if your child is someone who tends to lean into others and you feel that they're capable of handling it, you can encourage them to support, provide support to others. So offer a way that they can help. And that has the benefit of not only helping somebody else, uh, but it also research shows that when you help others, right, it helps you. And finally, by helping others, they are also getting social support. So that's something that is enormously helpful to do. Now, depending on your child's temperament, uh, if they're very introverted or very extroverted, right? Depending on that, they might need less or more social support. Uh, but again, knowing that you're there to support them, that support, social supports are out there for them, even if they decline it, is important. We know from research that just perceiving that people are there for you has enormous benefit. So what can you say, right? You know, getting support from family and friends is really helpful for people. So, you know, do turn to me if you need it. You know, I hope that you will turn to your friends, you know, although it's okay to be alone sometimes, you know, I'd rather you not isolate yourself or push me away or push your friends away. You know, we know that 
spending time with family and friends actually helps you feel better. Second thing is that I mentioned earlier that when you're you know, under, undergoing something traumatic, you can get irritable and, and get angry. So helping them to see that to the extent you can minimize day-to-day conflicts, that would be excellent at this time, right? Uh, but you're also communicating that basically that, you know, it's helpful. Like if they, let's say, if you and your friend, you say this is you talking to your child, if you and your friend have an argument, you know, take the time to resolve it or agree to put it behind you because it just adds to the stress that you're already facing. So it might be helpful for you to do that. And to the extent you can, you know, talk about how you feel, you know, um, talk to me, talk to your friends, you know, whoever you trust. We know that talking about it can be helpful. And it's a way of your mind adjusting to what happened. And through collective grieving, we know from research is very helpful. So it's okay. And so on the one hand, you're letting them know that talking about it um, is important, but you're also saying that it's okay not to discuss it with everybody or to go into your feelings and thoughts in detail. Um, and it's up to them. Um, and you're also communicating that should they need it, it's also okay to turn to a trained professional if they are feeling uncomfortable talking about it with you or with their friends. And this is something I mentioned, which is, you know, see that you know, maybe you can communicate that helping others is helpful to them. So making sure that there's a balance though, which is helping yourself is important and helping other people is important so that they're not doing one to the exclusion of the other. So now you've linked them with social support and you're also increasing their motivation to use a support. Now, again, I, I want you to know that it may not be the case that your child will immediately be receptive to these ideas that you share. It also doesn't mean that you have to share all these ideas with them. Um, It it means that you pick and choose, uh, you see what the moment brings and share some uh, of the things that we're going over today and some things you wait for a better time. The second thing you're linking them to is just educating them about ways to cope. You're telling them about, you know, what maybe what they're, you're definitely sharing with them that what they're feeling is normal. It's a common reaction to stress, uh, for trauma. And then you're giving them some basic information on coping. What is, so let's say they're already doing something that's really effective. You can praise them for their effective coping behaviors. And then you're just creating awareness of what they might be doing that's not helpful. And then you're offering them basic information on what might be more helpful to do. And again, you're inviting them, not demanding or telling them to do it. We mentioned earlier that thoughts, feelings, behaviors can influence each other. We also know that if you directly, you know, look at the way that you think and make adjustments and change unhelpful thoughts to helpful thoughts, Uh, that can affect emotions and behavior positively. If you make an adjustment and try to regulate your emotions directly, that can change the way you think and that can change the way, you know, the things that you do and so on. So if you enact some helpful behaviors, it has a positive effect on your mood. It has a positive effect on the way that you think. So now just, you know, giving them some information. So how do we manage emotions directly? Um, breathing exercises, you know, relaxation exercises, being mindful, being, being doing yoga, meditation. Now, those are maybe none of the things that your children do. But to the extent that they exercise, even going for a walk, anything that uses their physical body and allows them to be present in the moment uh, is what this is going for. So we talked about it earlier in a way about how to stabilize them, but even if they don't need immediate stabilization, like they're okay, still it is a helpful thing for them to keep in mind, no matter how small it is. Um, You know, keeping to routine is really important. We know that from the pandemic, that normal routine rituals and responsibilities went out the window. 
we know that keeping to them as much as possible keeps to a sense of normalcy, predictability, controllability, and it will help them feel secure and safe. This goes without saying, and I'm sure this is something that you do with your kids anyway, which is helping them to eat, sleep, rest, exercise, right? Your body needs healthy fuel to do that. Um, and that's important uh, today as well, just having a balanced activity diet. And what that means is given that your kids are in high school, right, they're doing a lot of things that are creating mastery. But it's also important that they do some things that are healthy to create pleasure. So even if it means listening to a happy song um, or exercise, as we mentioned, or going to their doing their sports, even if right now they're feeling sad and they don't feel like it. Um, and anything practical that you can do that you know that can be done right now to manage how they're feeling, a call a friend or complete tomorrow's homework. If you notice that they're under stress, no matter how small the practical action are that you're taking um, is fine. You're also communicating that it is okay to enjoy themselves during this time. <clears throat> so finding time to engage in their leisure and recreational activities uh, is important. Many people feel guilty enjoying themselves when they've experienced something traumatic. Um, so getting back to your routine, allowing yourself some enjoyment and distraction is important for your mental health. <clears throat> and feeling guilty about it just makes you feel worse. And it also makes you feel like you're not coping well. Now, this is something I'm sure that you're doing anyway as parents, right? You're limiting uh, how much uh, their social media they're, they're, they're going on or news. So to the extent you can, right? Keeping up with news and friends is important. But we know that repeatedly watching TV news or being on social media can actually increase stress levels. So not only because we know that the news media can present things in a very, very dramatic and catastrophic fashion, right? Which can increase your perception of danger and negativity in the world, social media, we know, can do the same thing. You can also make it look like everybody else is okay. You're not okay. Um, it can make it look like everybody else is beautiful and having fun, even though it may not be the case. So to the extent that they can limit it, this time is helpful, especially before they sleep, because all of these things can increase your adrenaline and adrenaline is just not healthy uh, or helpful when you're trying to sleep. Now, <clears throat> some degree of escapism, like watching TV or movies or distracting yourself from painful thoughts is helpful. Um, but communicating that, although allowing yourself to experience pleasure is important and distracting yourself at times is, can be useful when stress is high, excessive distraction, other escape behaviors, ultimately have the effect of just postponing and delaying your distress in the long run. So some degree of rest is important, as I mentioned, but helping your child know that approaching and engaging in, you know, their goals in life and doing safe things is important. So engaging in their normal life and facing instead of avoiding things that remind them of the student that passed away or something that upsets them uh, is important, right? In the beginning, it will create distress, but over time, they'll adjust to it. Uh, <clears throat> we know that if you avoid, it actually leads to more stress, more anxiety, more feeling that you're in danger and it increases your future avoidance as well. Uh, so let's say you avoid something that's making you anxious. We know that your brain files it away as a dangerous activity. So the next time you do it, you wind up feeling even more anxious and then you avoid more. So that can create what we call an avoidance cycle. So to the extent that they can go back to doing all the things, doing their routine, doing their obligations, seeing their friends, going back to normal activities, it's important. Yes, they do need some initial period of rest, but it is important that they do that. 
So we talked about how to manage emotions directly. We talked about what kinds of things are helpful to do and not do. And again, it's not that you are lecturing your students, your um, your children, but you are just taking the taking some time. Maybe there is a moment when you're talking to your child and a particular topic comes up, you can share that information. The final part is building resilient thinking. And we had said earlier that we would talk more about you know, how to empathize. There are two parts of it that are really important. On the one hand, your child needs to know that you understand that their suffering is real, that you're you know, helping them feel like what they're going through is normal, that it's okay for them to feel intensely, that their suffering is real, that you are there, you're empathizing, right? That you are there for them. That's on the one hand. That helps them regulate their emotions. They need to know you're in their corner. Then, and not right away, it's also important to communicate optimism and to offer a balanced perspective. And what I mean by that is you're not saying, I know you're suffering and you'll get over it. That's not what I mean. What I mean is to, you're promoting long-term optimism. Like let's say your child says, I'm never going to feel happy again, right? That's the moment to say, I know how painful this is. And I know one day you will feel less pain, right? That's enough to help them feel some degree of optimism. Again, to the extent you can promote kind, non-judgmental views of themselves, I should have done that. Well, I know people feel responsible for things that are not, they're not responsible for. You're feeling that way. It's important to know that, you know, there's nothing you could have done. It also means teaching them to be non-judgmental about other people. You know, they might say, you know, that friend of his didn't do this or that teacher or the parents should have done that, right? We know from research that when something happens that's traumatic, our mind searches for things that we could have done to prevent it. So it is their way of coping. But we know that the more not more judgmental you are, the more you start thinking, well, somebody should have done that or somebody should have done that, that actually makes you feel worse. And over time, it is actually unhelpful for your own recovery. So helping them to have balanced, positive thoughts for the future is the goal here. You're conveying some degree of optimism, but you're not doing it at the by invalidating how they're feeling. So it's a really fine balance, not easy being a parent, I know. Uh, and to the extent you can do both, that would be amazing. I mean, you're helping them to feel like whatever obstacles they're feeling, whatever challenges they're feeling that they can be dealt, dealt with, they can be overcome that you, you believe in their ability to handle things uh, and you're helping them uh, and providing support and help. The other thing is that when people start having this inner dialogue, sometimes when you have this inner dialogue, you don't even know you're having it. So sometimes people confuse thoughts for the truth. So let's say they worry about something. I worry that, you know, I'm never gonna find a friend like that again, or no one is going to understand me, or what if I can't concentrate on my studies and I won't do well, or whatever the worry thought is. Helping them to see that those are thoughts, that this is your inner dialogue of the past or the present or the future. And it's important not to confuse them. So you, if you, let's say your child says, I should have done more to save uh, this person, or I should have been with him so I could have, I could protect the student, right? Or they might say, I won't be able to handle it. I, I can't handle this pain. That doesn't mean any of that is actually true. So just remembering that those are worry thoughts and not facts helps you feel uh, much more regulated. The other thing is when people are, who are traumatized often have repeated intrusive thoughts, and that's completely normal, or images of the trauma. It's almost like your brain needs to do that in order to ultimately adjust to it. But because it's painful, people often try to stop thinking about it. And that's what affects natural recovery. 
which means that when, when the painful images comes, it's important to just let it go. So when you have a distressing thought, you're having a distressing feeling, just allowing them to flow instead of trying to suppress it uh, is important. So trying to suppress the way that you think, the way that you feel, the paradoxically, it actually then, it comes more. So the more you try to control your thoughts and feelings, the stronger they become. So what you're saying is that now that you recognize these are your worry thoughts, just, you know, let them be. A, you're not believing that they're true, but also don't try to stop them. Let them just pass through you. Because what we know is that if you do that, they just kind of pass away on their, on it, on their own. So I already mentioned this, being kind and non-judgmental is really, really important for recovery. So what you're saying is, you know, try to be kind to yourself and to others, you know. You may begin to doubt your own sense of self-worth uh, or your ability to cope, you know, like I don't have the strength to, to cope with this pain, right? And that, that something traumatic can alter your sense of self-worth, right? And what you're saying is talk to yourself the way that you might talk to a close friend. You know, practice being non-judgmental and give yourself and other people the benefit of the doubt, right? Most people mean well, right? Being judgmental can just cause you more pain and make you feel more angry um, if you are judgmental of other people. Uh, and if you are judgmental of yourself, that can make you feel ashamed. It can make you feel sad. It can make you feel guilty. Uh, and this includes not judging yourself for how you're feeling because often what happens is people start to feel, you know, oh my God, I'm not feeling enough or I'm feeling too much. So again, allowing that emotion to just pass uh, and not to judge yourself for having those feelings uh, is important. And just as your thoughts are thoughts, right? Other people are having thoughts too. And we don't know what people are thinking. So reminding ourselves that we don't know what people are thinking or feeling just as they don't know what we're feeling or thinking is important, right? You may assume that a friend is not feeling pain because he's not experienced, he's not expressing it to you. You may assume that someone is judging you. Uh, and when you do that, you're, you're basically, you, what you're doing is you're engaging in what we call mind reading. And that can then create distress for you. So it's possible that your friend has other ways of coping with what has happened. Maybe they don't feel comfortable sharing it with people. Um, it's possible that you're not being judged by other people. So remembering that mind reading, uh, and often when we mind read, we assume that people, that, you know, that somebody's thinking negatively about us. So it's important to kind of recognize that this is not, we, we don't have the awareness of what other people are thinking. And this is another thing that I think a lot of people do, which is that when you feel bad, often people feel like I'm not coping well. That's not really true. So reminding yourself that just because you're feeling, let's say sad or angry or you know, anxious, doesn't mean you're not coping. So coping is a behavior. So helping them to, to know again that it's normal to feel emotions. Just because I'm feeling bad doesn't mean that I am something bad is going to happen in the future. Or just because I'm feeling bad doesn't mean I did something wrong. Or just because you know, I'm feeling guilty doesn't mean that I did something wrong or something is wrong with me. Uh, or if I'm feeling really sad and I can't stop crying, it doesn't mean that I'm falling apart. It just means that I'm feeling sad. And I know that when something bad happens, it's, it's hard not to think that it will happen again and again and again. So reminding ourselves that something traumatic has happened, it doesn't mean that bad things will happen every day or they'll happen in the future, right? So it's important to not overgeneralize because otherwise these worry thoughts can take over. They'll worry about your health. They'll worry about themselves or their friends. So helping them to know that is important. And in general, I would say helping them to think in nuance and shades of gray rather than engaging in extreme thoughts, all or nothing. Like let's say your child says always, never, 
so-and-so should or ought or must think like that, right? These are very extreme, negative, harsh thoughts. And what we really want is just to kind of replace them with balance, more flexible thoughts. Now you can't make them think differently, but you can invite them to do it. You know, what has happened is already traumatic, you know, I'd rather not make the problem worse than it is already, right? So the more balanced, flexible, nuanced thoughts you have, the better that you will feel. You also know from research that when something negative happens in your life, <coughs> thinking of how you can learn from this and grow as a person is actually helpful for your well being. You also know that taking the time, you know, for example, when the pandemic happened, right, to thinking about sort of practicing daily gratitude. Um, was helpful to many people. And research shows that a daily practice of gratitude is actually very helpful for well-being. Uh, so that's something, you know, what am I, you know, grateful for today? What do I have? You know, I have my health, right? So whatever it is, however small the daily gratitude is, that really helps. Um, and again, one of the things without invalidating them, if you can help them feel optimistic, you know, and all you're saying is, you know, try to view the future with some measure of optimism, right? So we know that people get better over time um, when they are optimistic. And again, it's, it's, it's not to suggest that what they're going through, they may not be ready for it at this moment. It's been, it's too soon. But at some point, helping them to know that especially if you find your child saying, I can't handle this, I'm not gonna get better, I'm never gonna get over this, right? Those are moments to help them kind of believe in the resilience of the human spirit, right? That help them feel like no matter how much pain they're feeling today, you know, it will become less painful over time. It's not easy uh, to, to change the way people think. So, what are ways that you could in encourage it? You know, it sounds like you are saying, thinking that. It doesn't mean that it's true, you know? I can understand, you know, why you feel the way that you do, you know? Is there a way to think differently? You know, are there other ways to think about it? You know, is it possible that what you're thinking may not be true, you know? What would you say to your friend? You know, this is what I might say, you know, what may be more helpful to think, you know, and helping them to know that you are there to support them and that they have the capacity to handle it are equally important. So if you are able to use any of these statements to help them and invite them, you're not forcing them to think differently, you're inviting them to. You're doing it from a perspective of invitation. So it allows them to be more receptive to what you're offering. And finally, um, you can link them to other help, right? So services they might need. You might need some counseling at school. They might need a tutor. They might need treatment, you know, they have, uh, you know, vulnerability for anxiety, depression, right? Helping them to, um, you know, seek help is really important, right? And when do you start to think, well, all right, I need to get this, my child some help. If you know that their emotions keep getting triggered when they're just going about their daily lives, you know, and it just keeps on increasing, it's getting more intense, it's getting more frequent, it's getting more persistent, um, or their thoughts are very extreme, very distorted, and they're persistently so. And, and over the coming weeks, it doesn't sort of subside. Um, or if they're engaging in behaviors that are either persistently problematic or unhelpful, or it's actually affecting their functioning. So even if it is something that will go away on its own, if they're doing something that's affecting their functioning today negatively, you can still seek help for sure. Uh, you know, like their work, their social, you know, let's say their schoolwork, their social relationships or personal obligations, whatever it is. 
is negatively impacted, it's okay. Even if it will get better on its own, they can still seek help. So as I mentioned earlier, right, those thoughts, feelings, and, and emotions all feed off each other. So if one is very extreme, they're going to feel more extreme emotions and engage in more extreme behaviors. So thoughts and behaviors and emotions can, can spiral. Um, and uh, it's important that they see that going to a trained professional is a sign of strength. Uh, so on the one hand, you're not assuming that they're traumatized just because they're feeling emotional, right? Just because they had a something traumatic happen, right? And on the same hand, right, recognizing that if you do need help, it's it's okay, right? Not be afraid of uh, seeking it. And in fact, thinking that when I know when I can say that I need help, whether it's they need help from you or whether they need help from a professional, that it is a sign of strength. So if, they're, if they want support, or their reactions don't gradually resolve, seeing someone who is trained in you know, trauma-focused treatment is important. So that's something that I, would, I will leave you with. So I hope that you have uh, some information to help look to see what's going on with your child, to lean in and to listen to them and to link them to support, to information and to services. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McGinn. Um, I don't see any questions on the Google form, um, but we will share the slides and presentation for a limited amount of time so families can view it. I have one question if you have time. Of so, course. So you, you touched upon some of this, but parenting in the midst of a pandemic as you shared, return to school, Processing loss are all challenging. Um, yeah. Myself, do you have advice for parents and families as the school year winds down, as we think about the summer as the next transition in terms of how to foster resilience? Yeah, I would say engaging them in you know activities that are you know what you would do for a normal summer. On the one hand, right, so not to kind of hold back just because of the pandemic but also to ensure that your child does have some downtime is important. Um, so not avoiding activities because now you feel like something negative has happened or the pandemic, you know, uh, not engaging in those activities is not ideal on the one hand, yet on the other hand, not filling them with activities so they have no downtime either is, is also not important. Sarah, is there any questions from your end? If, no, if, I'm, oh, sorry, Kyle. Sorry, um, you, sometimes students don't wanna talk about their emotions or feelings. Any suggestions if parents see that their kids need support, but they don't wanna talk about it? Right, I think, I think indicating that, you know, not feeling emotions is okay. Not wanting to share it with you as a parent is okay. And that it is helpful to talk to people as well. So kind of like you're communicating all parts of it, that I get that you don't want to talk to me, you know? Um, and maybe there's someone else that you feel that you could talk to, right? You don't have to share details. You don't have to go into, you know, a lot. But, you know, we know that when something traumatic happens, that talking to someone that you trust is important. You know, you might worry about being a burden. You may feel that you'll feel worse, right? But we know all in all that talking to somebody that you trust without going into too much detail can help you feel better. So that way you're respecting it on the one hand and making them feel like you're not going to pressure them, but yet conveying the information, you know? Other than that, I would say being mindful and attentive to what you can see so what you can see is their behaviors, you know, what you can see is what they're doing or not doing. Uh, so, so saying, you know, I understand that this is, I noticed that you're doing X or I noticed that you're not doing X, you know, and it may be helpful to talk about it. You know? This is common when something traumatic happens. Uh, it's, it's these, you know, doing this or not doing this is common. And yet it suggests to me that you, you know, maybe feeling more than you're letting on. 
great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.